Alrighty, we have one more minute. And as always, if any of you are speakers, you know this, this feeling like 20 minutes before you go on stage, there's nobody here. You start to question, are you in the right room? Turns out you are. 10 minutes, someone is trickling in going, you yeah, know, and leaving again. But now we're way more people than we were a couple of minutes ago, which I think is a good thing. We're still, and there the time just changed to 12, no, 11.40. One other issue, if you're on a different time zone, my, my computer is one hour ahead. It scared the living daylights out of me about an hour ago. Welcome to the untruthful art. And I want to start with saying that this session is not designed, per se, to make people uncomfortable, but it has been known to do that. Again, that is not my point, but these things that I'm going to show you are scary in many ways, because we are going to see ourselves. And when it comes to the name, so one of the best known authors in this space of data visualization is Alberto Cairo. And if you have not seen his book, I diff, or books, I should say, go look at them because they are awesome. And this session name, The Untruthful Art, is actually a nod to one of his books called The Truthful Art. And I, out of the blue, he contacted me on Twitter. This, this giant with a gazillion followers goes, hey man, I like your title. But he did. He was not sarcastic, so he's okay with it. Let's kick this off. So, we live in the age of information. And in 2021, 79 trillion gigabytes, that's 79 zettabytes of data, was produced. I'm pretty sure that this is even the split between porn and spam. And some, well, that's half of it. And the other half is probably going to be cat pictures and maybe something useful. I'm not entirely sure about the last part, but yes. That's, that's kind of the, the, the distribution of the information, I should say. <laughs> but the, the, the question is, how much of it is true? Well, what is true anyway? It's kind of a philosophical question, and the thing is, we cannot answer that. What is truth? The world is simply too complex. And in this world of complexity, everybody's trying to push an agenda to change an outcome. To push an agenda, to change an outcome, and to influence opinion. And trust me, the only thing worse than getting played is getting played without realizing it. So we are going to look at what deception looks like. Some of these things are obvious from the back of the room. Some of them are not going to be obvious standing here. That's the scary part. We're going to see how to spot foul play. Most of the time, keyword being most, you're going to find a kind of small details that are going to stick out like a sore thumb. And that's what you're looking for when it comes to weird visualizations. And we're going to show you what makes the data visualization craft so darned dangerous, because this is, well, you know the, the, the old adage that when you pull the pin, Mr. Grenade is no longer your friend. Data bits. And my goal today is to show you the central tenet of visual trickery. Ourselves. We see exactly what we want to see. And that is why this is so dangerous, because by creating a plausible narrative, we can mislead just about anyone. And that's all it takes. My name is Alexander. I am from Sweden, which is one hour ahead, I'll, as my computer told me. I, these days, I work as a principal solutions architect, which is, by the way, the best title I've ever had, because nobody has a clue what I do. Well, that's kind of easy, though. I, I make data matter. I literally try to help people make their data matter because it doesn't matter if you have a gazillion petabytes of information. It doesn't matter what kind of insights you have of the data. It only matters what kind of business outcome you can push from the data, i.e. make the data matter. I might be a bit of a Star Wars fan, as you're going to see. 
one of the issues with doing these kinds of sessions is that I, I've realized that my audience is becoming younger and younger and younger. I'm not. And it turns out that a lot of youngish people have not seen Star Wars. I find this to be a huge issue. But that's another session. I do a few things. I'm a data platform MVP, which means I am the odd man out at this conference. I cannot code for the life of me. I am not kidding. Well, I can do SQL, but anything that gets compiled, if you see me try it, run. I host a podcast called Native in Tech, and yes, that is the Doom game logo. And again, it's kind of an old game, but check it out. It's, it's pretty good. Much better than Super Mario. So we're going to start with axis manipulation. And let me introduce you to um, actually someone from Sweden. This is Greta. And Greta is angry. In fact, Greta is angry as because she's got it into her head that the environment is going to shit. Quaint. But the thing is, is it really? I mean, there, there are a lot of opposing views on this. And, well, again, what is truth? Let's look at the actual data and see what we can figure out. So this was put up on the internet, because everything on the internet is true. I know that for a fact. It's by the uh, National Review, which is a, a um, fairly conservative news outlet of the, the US. And they put up this and said, well, this is the only climate change chart you'll ever need to see. Mic drop. Yes. And as you can clearly see, there is nothing going on. Move along, move along. So what kind of issues do we have with this chart? Well, they're legion. Let's unpack them a bit. Let's look at the... Um, we're going to do something that is not necessarily a, the right thing, but from an analysis point of view, we're going to do it anyways. Because we have a zero, that is generally a good thing, and we want to have the scale to go to zero. But in this case, we're going to look at the numbers around this. So we are at, what is it, uh, 57 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 13.7 degrees centigrade. And if we look at that, well, things are kind of moving upwards. But the thing is, this is not a very representative data set because this is data averaged over the entire planet. I was never very good at geography, trust me on that one, but even I know that there are different oceans with different temperatures. So maybe this averaging thing of the entire world might not be the way to go. But I can make one worse thing. Let's, instead of looking at the, the absolutes, let's look at the changes, i.e. the anomaly. Oops. Yeah. The actual change per data point. Kinda went upwards around here. What happened in the 40s and the 50s? Well, there was a bit of a war on, and they started blowing stuff up with nuclear weapons. They kind of got their senses again, and then everything really, really went to crap. So I'm pretty convinced that, yes, Greta is probably on to something here. She's right to be angry. So everything around the numbers is called scaffolding, or referred to as scaffolding. We have the, the, um, the axes and any kind of text, and you're going to see an um, example of more scaffolding in a bit. But as we can see here, the conversion rate, the conversion rate is, is the number of people coming to a website um, and turning into a sale. And since my, my bonus is calculated from the, the, um, the, the conversion rate, I, I, I'm going to get a pretty hefty bonus. I mean, look at March and April. Holy crap, yes, score. How about that? Remember what I told you about the uh, zero thing? Yeah, hello. So we are normalizing everything to 6%. And relative, well, between 6 and 7%, suddenly a very small change is going to be enormous. And as we all know, size matters. Because if we do this instead, like we should have done, have a zero, well, it's still a pretty impressive change. But it's not this drop everything and run size of change. Access manipulation is controlled essentially by setting a 
a baseline to something else, okay? But sometimes access manipulation can be done through Photoshop and sheer incompetence. Let's look at this. Um, yeah, so 9, 11, 18, 21, and 20, why, why is that so much bigger? Because someone didn't realize how Photoshop works as or Photoshop or, or Illustrator or anything essentially. So they, they've, yes, they wanted to make this thing bigger in that axis. It turned out that it's gonna go that way as well. So it's not wrong per se, but a much better visual would be this. But it's not kind of the same thing though. What is it with politicians and numbers? Oh, and when it comes to numbers, there is a, a news outlet or whatever we're going to call them, in the U.S. called Fox News. It is an absolute inexhaustible source of terrible visuals. Let me bring you this. So this is job loss in the U.S. by quarter from December 07 to June 10. What are we, what are we looking at? There are a few things wrong, like what's not here? Well, there is no axis here. Funny that. Oh, yeah, 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 but it's going to get worse because these points are not equidistant. I'm pretty sure that the distance between December 07 and September 08 is not the same as March 09 and, and definitely not June 10. So the, the, um, the amount of force that has been applied to this visual in order to make it look like a line it's impressive. So what do we do? Well, we bring out the base data. And the base data is going to be found in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I can make this line straight. I can do this in, in Power BI, which is my, my tool of choice, by putting out these very arbitrarily chosen points and moving them so the line is straight. But if I actually were to put them where they should have been, hmm, not quite a straight line. And one might argue that there might just be some data here that was completely just glossed over a bit. And yes, it is. So from the line that was straight to this, it's the same data, but it's visualized in a terrible, terrible way. Bad Fox News. And it's not only Fox News, it's rampant. This is taken from the World Equity Report of 2017. It's a pretty hefty uh, publication. And what did they do here? Yeah, just look there. They made the darn thing go exponential. You don't do that. No, bad. And, and if, you, if you didn't know what you're looking at, I mean, what you can see here is that something happens and suddenly everything just goes, goes vertical. Your eyes are gonna see that immediately and wonder what, what happened there. And very few people know what this kind of, of change means. No, just don't. So what can we learn from this first part? Well. Look at the scaffolding. It's going to tell you something. It's there for a reason. Bar chart axis should almost always include a zero because that's going to give you something um, relative to. And axis should not ever change scales midstream. And if you still feel the urge to do so, make sure that there's like an enormous sign on the door going, we changed the scales. We're going to see a sort of kind of the same thing at the end. It's something done by the British government. So let's go for the second part, cherry picking. This is where it is essential that you know Star Wars. Is Darth Vader a good leader? Yes or no? What is cherry picking? Cherry picking is the art of choosing not only what I ask, but also who I ask. Because if I just choose arbitrarily, kind of gerrymandering, 
I can, I can essentially drive the narrative. So I can know exactly what kind of answer I'm going to get. And then I can plot it and go, well, obviously Darth Vader is a gr good leader. And yes, I might be a bit of a Star Wars fan. I might have built a full-size R2-D2. Yes, but that's a different story. And let's go to Sweden. So it turns out where I'm from, Sweden, is the, is it the second or the third most dangerous country in Europe. I wasn't aware of this, but it's again, it's on the internet, so it's clearly the case. And we're in good company. We have the Ukraine. Now, th this is a couple of years old, I'll have to say that, but I could, because I kind of think that the Ukraine is slightly more dangerous these days for reasons. But yes, we're number two. And um, here's an issue with this. Oh, there's a lot of issues with it. But the first one is this website is only showing data that people put in. It's self-reported data. Meaning, A, you need to find it. And B, you need to have a very strong opinion of what dangerous means. I don't know what you measure danger in. Kilos? Meters? I don't know. But apparently it's very, very dangerous in Sweden. You should come check it out. So what do we do? Well, we go and look at the base data again. This is the, the Swedish base data from the, the um, well, I'm not going to even try to translate that. And what we can see is that the number of, of reported crimes are going up. But the number of actual violent crimes, not so much. Does this mean that the notorious no-go zones in Sweden don't exist? Yes, it does. There are no no-go zones in Sweden. Does this mean that Sweden is perfect? Heck no. But it's nowhere near as bad as some people want to make you think. Let's turn our eyes to the, the UK for a bit. And this is the UK national debt as a percentage of the gross domestic product. And as you can see, it has tripled. Holy cow, things are going on in this country. Just look at it. It's going sideways. Yeah. Um, it starts in 1995 and ends in 2016. I'm pretty sure that there has been history before 1995, and there is probably going to be data after 2016 as well. So what do we do? We go look at the data. And suddenly it looks like this. Hmm. So yes, if we're here, we've seen an increase. But if we kind of take into account the other stuff, it's not that bad. So relative is important. Yes, sir. That, well, that's a good point. That's a good point. But, it's, but still, things do change over time. But yes, sir, that's a very good point. So, well, to paraphrase the, the TV series Chernobyl, it's not great, it's not terrible. We can keep going. This was pointed out to me, um, essentially it was a, a Twitter thread that someone pointed to me and said, you, you need to look at this. And I did. So, there was this tweet by... Bjorn Lomborg, he is a Danish um, climate denier. In his world, there is no issues at all with the climate. So he put this out with EPA, the, the Environmental Protection Agency data, and said, well, obviously there is not an issue here. Just look at it. And this was found by a professor, Andrew Dessler, uh, of atmospheric sciences at Texas A&M. And he went, huh? That doesn't gel. Interesting. This is actual EPA data. There is nothing wrong with this graph. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. So there has to be some other shenanigans. And yes, there is. So he went into the data and it realized that the 1930s, they were warm in the US. Yes, but they were not that warm. And the 2010s, they barely show up. How come this is the case? Well, the trick here is heat wave index. It turns out that there is a definition of heat wave index. You're going to love this one. According to a 1999 paper, a heat wave index counts the occurrence of four day heat waves of temperatures exceeding one in a 10 year recurrence. Let's just say that it is a different way of looking at heat waves. Okay, so 
what he did then, Andrew Dessler, he went back to the data and took something more relevant. And he decided to plot the, um, some, well, this is the, the time series that looks at the, the actual temperatures and not this heat wave index. And it turns out that, yeah, it's definitely going up. Again, Greta is onto something. But this is actually just half the truth. The other small detail in this is that this is again only looking at the US. If you were to look at the entire world, huh, funny that. So using the right data matters. So what can we figure out here? Well, always look for the agenda. Someone is trying to sell you something. If you don't know what it is, they're probably trying to sell you. It's kind of like with Facebook. Consider the responders. If I were to ask a discrete group, um, women in Pakistan, I am going to have a completely different answer to whatever question to white middle-aged Americans in Oklahoma. I can guarantee you that. By choosing who I'm asking, I'm going to pretty much drive the answers to my benefit. And if you can, always look at the base data. Because as soon as someone does some cooking with the data, they can pretty much lead you anywhere. And we're going to see that in a bit. So let's go for comparisons. It's important to compare apples. And this is a very, very uh, dim apple. Just trust me. I, there is an, an apple there, and that's a military six-valve trombone from 1866. It's important to com compare apples to apples and not apples to trombones, as I'm going to show you in a bit. Let's go to Fox News again. Comparing is hard if you don't even have basic literary skills. The last 18 weeks of June... Come again? Yes. So this is what you can expect from Fox News. Let's go here instead. These are the 10 most dangerous cities in the US. And well, again, it's on the internet, so it's clearly true. And it's a pretty good visual. It really points something out. I don't know what it is, but apparently it's dangerous. So how do we define danger? We don't know that. What do we do with this? Well, this is called Fluff. Fluff is everything here that is not driving any understanding of the data at all. If I were to take away the fluff and go to a more normal graph, well, the issues are starting to pop up. These are the 10 most dangerous cities in the US, and Chicago is sticking out like a sore thumb. But again, we don't have an axis. How, how do you measure danger on a scale from 1 to 15? I don't know. So what if we were to put in the scale to see what this actually is showing? Ah, the number of homicides since 2019 by city. We're back to my terrible geography skills again. Because it turns out that Chicago and Baltimore are kind of different. Baltimore is small, Chicago is not. That's not of entirely the, the, um, the population of Sweden, but sort of kind of. So this kind of means that we cannot compare them. But if we were to control for population size, i.e. do some math, homicide rates for 100,000 residents by city, suddenly we can compare them without having to look at the absolute numbers. And suddenly, Baltimore is over there and Chicago is over there. Huh. Data matters. Display matters. And another thing when you compare data is that you look at data and go, okay, this is apparently related in some way. Are they? United States unemployment and GDP change by year. No, I just put them in the same graph. But your brain is going, how, how does that include? Yeah, no. It would be much better to break them apart and do this and have a discussion about the, the numbers, essentially, and not try to force them in the same graph. Because putting them in the same graph implies that they are related, which is not necessarily the case. 
when the pandemic hit, a bit of a background. I used to be a paramedic, and I, I, I know pre-hospital medicine, I know trauma medicine fairly well. When it comes to pandemic stuff, not at all. But I know data, and I, I realized earlier that nah, I'm not going to touch COVID data with a 10-foot pole for about a decade, because the data quality is crap. But some of the COVID stuff has managed to sneak into this session. I want to start with this. This was um, probably about a year and a half ago. The BBC, again, showed these graphs. And as we can clearly see, uh, Northern Ireland is, is facing a bit of an issue over here. And um, yeah, it's about the same as in, oh dear, look at the scales. They're completely different scales. But your eyes are going to go, wow, what's happening in Northern Ireland? You don't do this. You never show these things because your eyes are going to think it's the same scale. If you mix up the colors, then that's a whole different ballgame. Suddenly your, your brain is going to go, well, something is different here. Anyone in the UX space are going to go, no, and run screaming away from this. And if this is done by the BBC, that's a pretty revered institution. Oh, we're going to get in and worse in a bit. Don't worry. Then we can look at revenue. Again, when it comes to revenue, it seems like I bought the right stock because it is absolutely fantastic. Just look at this. It's going up, up and away. I'm, I'm going to be rich. Mm, yeah. This turns out to be cumulative revenue because look at the scale. Unless we're looking at Microsoft or Google, this is a lot of money. So what does this mean? Well, it means that you need to really have a terrible year in order for a cumulative increase to go down. But if we, instead of looking at the cumulative increase, we look at the relative increase. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm going to sell the stock. It's the same data. You just plot it in a different way. And when it comes to relative things, this is the number of years of cancelled Netflix subscriptions it would take to buy the average house in parts of the UK. Would you say that that is a relevant comparison? I'm very happy that no one said yes, because I'd argue it isn't. And it's getting pretty expensive. So what can we learn from this? Well, always compare apples to apples, because you can compare two things. It's not going to work, but you can create a narrative around it, and people are going to go, no, this, this sounds about right. And compared to what? I am the world's best speaker. Compared to my cats. They've never been on stage. Is that a fair comparison? No! But it's one comparison that people make. Well, generally, people don't compare me to the best speakers, but uh, you get my point. And consider always the absolute versus the cumulative increase. The numbers really matter. Again, if you can, look at the base data. I was about to say that was the fun part, but we still have a few fun slides before this turns serious for real. Correlating causation. So, causation is the action of causing something. And the relationship between cause and effect, that's causality. There is the saying that correlation and causality or correlation, of, uh, correlation and causation does not mix. And that's generally true. Let's look at this. The US unemployment rate has really fallen since 2013 when Britney Spears released Work Bitch. Again, it's on the internet. It's there for all to see. That's why. That's correlation and causality going that way. And, well, the per capita consumption of cheese in the US and the total revenue generated by golf courses very clearly correlate. But what is not there is causality. I can guarantee you that these are not, they're, they're not driving each other, but they correlate. It looks like they drive each other. And again, this is what the mind does. We see what we want to see, even though cheese and, and golf courses 
I'm sure someone wants to see it. So what we are essentially doing is this. Either that is a pretty fat cat, or this may not be causative. Make sense? But I would kind of like to meet that cat. So why is this an issue? Because of this. This is glyphosate. Let me tell you a story. This is, is more commonly known as, as Roundup. This is a weed killer that was brought to the market by the Monsanto Corporation in 1974. And since then, there have been all kinds of very creative ways to market it. It's been called, for instance, it's safer than table salt. And, um, well, it's practically non-toxic to mammals, birds, and fish. Okay. Uh, the debate about Roundup being carcinogenic is, is very much alive today, and people are, are yearly granted huge sums in damages when they claim that Roundup has caused their cancer. I don't know. I'm not going to even dive into that medicine, because the world doesn't know. Take, for instance, the, the, um, the 2015 World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer. They stated that glyphosate was classified as probably carcinogenic in humans. That same year, the European Food Safety Authority, they concluded in November of 2015 that the substance is unlikely to pose a carcinogenic threat to humans. So, nobody knows. Again, why does this matter? It matters because people like to see things that are not there, like this. So, without having any firm evidence of the carcinogenic effects of glyphosate, well, why don't we create this? And while we're at it, let's toss the whole um, GE, the, the gene um, therapy corn stuff, under the bus as well. How? What? Do we see any issues with it? Yes, we do. Remember what I told you about axis going to zero? All right. So this one goes to four. Well, oh, that's, that's fine. This one goes to minus 10. And this is the percentage of corn and the glyphosate applied in tons, thousands of tons. How do you apply minus 10,000 tons? I don't know. So this is shit. I, I cannot put it in a better way. This is a horrible visual. But again, you see exactly what you want to see. You see the, the scale. You see the lines kind of um, go on top of each other. This is apparently something that is driving the thyroid cancer incidence. No, it isn't. Again, why is this an issue? I mean, people can read up. This is Andrew Wakefield. Andrew Wakefield is, well, he was a British physician. And in 1998, he put up a paper in Nature, which is one of the most prominent medical uh, journals, where he linked the MMR vaccine that we give to children to autism. This paper has been redacted. It's been torn to shreds. There is no scientific evidence for this at all. Zip. Nada. But this did not stop him from spreading his crap. He was struck from the register. He's no longer allowed to practice medicine. How's that for a bad boy? But it does not stop people from um, spreading this uh, fantasies. Again, how is this an issue? Well, as people are being diagnosed with autism every day, Just think of what happens if you start to link things that are probably very innocent together, like this. We can see that organic food sales are going up, and so is the prevalence of autism. Remember what I said about correlation and causation? People see what they want to see. So what can we really read out of this graph? Well, I can tell you with some certainty that 
organic food sales are going up. And autism is going up. That's it. Full stop, period. That is the only thing that I can say. They have nothing to do with each other. But they are in the same graph. The designer of this graph is trying to show you that this is indeed the case. So why is this an issue? Well, consider parents pushed to the absolute breaking point, trying to find a way to care for a severely autistic child. They have nothing left. They have no resource left. And they find this. They find something to latch on to, something to basically anchor them and go, yeah, this, this is why. We need to go on the barricades. We need to make the world see how horrible the organic food sales are. This is why my child is sick. And from there, going to violence, it's not very far. So this is where it starts to become dangerous with data visualization. So what can we learn here? Well, just because you can compare two things doesn't mean you should. And the scale that you put in will decide the curve. Remember that we had something going to 4 and minus 10. If I work with the scale, well, the lines are going to intersect. That's all they're going to do, but your mind is going to see something that is not necessarily there. And correlation does not equal causation. When it comes to t-shirts, this is one of my favorites. I'm considering having a tattoo with this message because it is apparently extremely difficult for people to realize. What have I told you eight times already? People see what they want to see. Let me drive that home for you a bit. Let's go for purposeful bias. There is a party in India. Well, it's essentially the party, the, the um, Bharatiya Janata Party, or the BJT. They have a very, very clear agenda. That agenda is to keep Narendra Modi as the Prime Minister of India. Easy. But, like a lot of other uh, political parties, they kind of play fast and loose with numbers. So they put up this gem on Twitter a couple of years back. And this is the truth of petroleum price hikes in India. And well, just look at it. It's, huh? So I was bad at geography. I was even worse at math. Trust me. But what the heck is going on? Right? Really isn't... 80 rupees, shouldn't that be more? <laughs> Everybody went, what that? And started laughing, right? But what if we take away the fluff? The lines are gone, or the arrows are gone, I should say. And if we turn this into a normal table, ah, it's starting to make sense. 33, 40, 71, 80, it's, it's going upwards. That's a reasonable trend. So if we take all this information and put it back into the visual, it should look like this. Ah. And that is the truth of price hikes in India. Why would anyone do that? Like, are people that stupid? Yeah. And it's, it's terrible that we always think that, oh, well, everybody else is going to fall for this, but I'm not because I work with this. Yeah, if that was only the case. Let's go to the US. So we're going to look at the 2012 election. I am not going to look at the 2020 election. Ever. Because I kind of like my life. And this is why I will never do this session in the US, by the way. Just, just saying. So the 2012 election, it's far enough in, the, in history that I, it's, it's fairly safe to poke fun at. So if we were to, um, to color in the states that voted, what, what, what happened in, in um, 2012 was that we had Mitt Romney, the, the uh, Republican that um, opposed uh, the incumbent um, Barack Obama, the Democrats. And well, if we, if we, if we um, color the states like they voted, 
Well, it's kind of a toss-up, right? Ah. This is not driving my narrative. So instead of looking at the states, let's look at the counties. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of red. Anybody is not... Well, I'm, I'm hoping that nobody is, is colorblind, but this is a lot of red to a fairly small amount of blue. So this means that maybe there is something to this whole narrative of having the, the um, election stolen, right? Because it's obvious, if you were to look at this map, that the Republicans should have won, right? I mean, it's, it's so much red and not much blue, right? Huh. So what's going on here? Well, first of all, I, I, I chose to tell you his story with a few nudges. I never said that Republicans did win. I said the Repub Republicans should have won just looking at the map. And if people see this in the paper, they're gonna go, huh, yeah, that's what I always thought. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that the Republicans actually did win. The Democrats, they kind of, they stole it. You know, the whole spiel. Well, it turns out that land don't vote. People do. And that means that we need to look at where people live. And that's, that takes time. That's difficult. No, let's just toss this in the faces of people and go, yep, that's the truth. It is the truth, but it's not the entire truth. So if we were to look at the number of voters by state, over here we have California. There's a crap ton of people living in California. And over here we have Wyoming. Wyoming has wonderful, enormous plains and cattle, a lot of cows. It turns out that a surprisingly few number of cows do vote. If they did, maybe that bar would have been higher. So this is why there are a fewer number of, of counties voting Democrat, but the number of people in those counties add up to this. Funny that, again. <laughs> So at the end of the day, it was 60.6 .6 million Republican and 64.2 million Democrats. And then we have the whole mess of electoral votes, and I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot poll. That's an interesting discussion about democracy. But we're going to stay in the U.S. We're going to go to the sunshine state of Florida. Florida is a fantastic place unless you're there when there is a tornado, because then it kind of sucks. But otherwise, it's, it's wonderful. It's very warm and stuff. This was put in Reuters, or put out by Reuters in 2005. And Reuters is a fairly established news outlet, right? And this was to uh, explain a new law. In 2005, the Stand Your Ground law, it establishes a right by which a person may defend oneself or others, known as the right of self-defense, against threats or perceived threats, regardless of if you could have backed out of the situation and you are allowed to use deadly force. Put into simpler terms, if someone were to come up to me on the street and start to scream at me, and I perceive that as a threat, I am within my rights to pull a gun and shoot them in the face. That's essentially what this law says. I already have a few issues with this, but it's going to get worse. Okay, so the point was to make people think twice before doing stupid stuff like robberies and such. And as we can clearly see, when Florida enacted the standard ground law, the number of homicide... Wait a second. Yeah. Have you figured out the issue here yet? Look at the axes. Someone had a brainwave. They should not have. If you were to take this and do this instead, this is what happened. Funny that, when you give people the right 
to shoot others in the face. Do not be surprised if the number of homicides rise pretty quickly. Just saying. Friends don't shoot friends in the face. And don't shoot robbers in the face either. Just don't. I did some research. I've done a lot of research, but I, I, I have been able, unable to verify the claim that the, uh, the graphic designer that did this, they claimed that they wanted to show how blood was flowing down. I'm going to call bullshit on that because there is no excuse in my view for doing this. I mean, just look at this. This, this was literally to taken by a newspaper, or I can't remember if it was a newspaper on the, or the internet. It's clear, if you just look at the, the, uh, the lines, that the number of, of homicides went down. It is clearly someone trying to drive a narrative. What have I told you nine times now? We see exactly what we want to see. And if you want to think that this law is a great idea, that's all you need. So, we go to the UK. From the start of the pandemic, the UK government has put out the weekly COVID-19 report. This has been identical month to month. It's a really good tome of information. Good numbers, good visuals, all that stuff. I'm not criticizing that at all. It's, it's in fact, a pretty good um, data set. And week 41 of 2020, they started to add the, the seasonal flu as well. So it went from the, the weekly COVID-19 report to the weekly COVID-19 and seasonal flu report. All right? And what you didn't know was in week 40, September, things were not looking so great. But come week 41, everything was fine. They finally solved the issues with COVID, as we can see, clearly see on this, this map. I mean, this is bad. This is good, right? That's the sound of someone who just saw what happened. Again, there is nothing has changed. You can take these two reports, week 40 and week 41, and hold them up be beside you, and you're not going to see any change. There is no difference. The only change is the data set behind. What did they do? They changed the scales. There is no mention of this anywhere in this, in this report. Nothing. If that is not someone not happy with the numbers trying to drive a narrative, I don't know what is. Just don't. Because, again, people see what they want to see, right? So what can we learn from this? Well, people have an attention, a limited attention. Ooh, squirrel. That's pretty much what happens. We have a very limited attention span. We can only grab on to someone for that long. In essence, having you here in, in 60 minutes, that's kind of cruel, because we generally only can be active for about five minutes at a time, and then I have to do something stupid in order to get you awake again. Ah, suddenly everybody's awake. He's going to do something stupid. Always be careful with maps, because this is a quirk of the brain. We look at a map, or any large-scale visual, essentially, and think that all the areas are equally in size. And when you add stuff like population to an enormous continent like the northern U.S., well, suddenly that really doesn't work. Because again, there is a lot of people in California and a lot of cows in Wyoming. And the cows don't vote that I know of. Maybe. Visuals are powerful. There is this notion of uh, people being... Well, as, as a teacher, I'm a certified trainer, so I, I train people on, on Microsoft stuff, for instance. And there is this prevalent uh, fantasy, if you will, that people are visual learners or auditive learners or 
in kinesthetic learners. I'm sorry, but the science does not support that. What it does support is that some people find it easier to consume different kinds of information, and especially if you mix it up, then it's easier. Which part of the brain is the largest when it comes to the sensors, sensory input? Well, the visual cortex. Cortex, not the cortex. The visual cortex is the largest part of the brain when it comes to processing input because the computational needs to look at the images is enormous, which also means that we tend to ascribe more um, importance to visual stuff. Which kind of brings us to a few issues when it comes to visuals, because visuals are powerful. There's this saying that a, a, a picture tells a thousand words. Yes. Why? Because the brain is lazy. We don't want to read a thousand words if we can look at a cool picture that says the same thing. It's obvious. So serve up a few non cool pictures and you can pretty much lead anyone anywhere. So where did the go for this? Well, my goal was to show you how easily we can trick ourselves with, with uh, data, right? And I started writing out this, this session. It's been many, many years in the making, and I put my pen to paper about two and a half, three years ago when I started creating it. And at first it was hilarious finding all the, shall we say, creative ways of people really messing things up with data. I mean, it's the, the, the Indian tweets. It's fantastic. I could not stop laughing until I realized, wait, wait a second, there's a crap ton of this. And uh, if I can see it, which is a good thing, how much is it that I am not seeing? Hmm. So it turns out that it's a bit of a... Um, forest fire, actually. It's not funny anymore when you realize how many of these obvious tricks are still being used today. You can literally take up any uh, newspaper or go to any news outlet. You are going to see some variation of the theme of creative ways of doing horrible things with visuals, right? So the question is, are we completely doomed? Right now, I'm not feeling like this super positive guy. And yes, I'm from Sweden, that's how we work, but yes. Are we doomed? No, I don't think so. I don't think we are, but willful ignorance is rampant. So many people that much prefer to not dig into the information, not look critically at stuff, because again, we are lazy and we're there's so much trying to get our attention. But what if there was a way to uh, make people think for themselves? And the solution is as obvious as is, is unheard of. Data literacy. I mean, we know how to automatically interpret red lights. Yeah. We know not to buy shady stuff from interesting people in an alley we know not to eat yellow snow. These, these are kind of obvious things. What if, what if we were able to teach our kids how to kind of think critically about data and do that from a very, very young age? Essentially, teach the concept in school. I wonder just how much of the, the um, disinformation that could be stemmed by teaching kids about data literacy from a young age. Our old, as old folks, we're, we're kind of down the band already, but kids, you can still impress kids. So these are a few of the books that I highly recommend. Now, they are, th this is a dangerous a bit of a um, rabbit hole if you go down, because you're going to learn so much and don't Blame me if you do. These are amazing. And one of the, the, the funniest ones is the factfulness of Hans Rosling. He was an amazing uh, science communicator. Um, unfortunately, he passed away a couple years back. But look at these. The, these are amazing. And you're not going to do data visualization the same way again. And this is not only applicable to data visual stuff. 
I'm assuming that a lot of you are um, developers. You're going to find that this comes back in user experience and user interface. It's kind of the same methods, if you will. So we've seen examples of everything from honest mistakes to outright lies. What can we conclude? With great Power BI, I'm sorry, I do Power BI for most of my, my days, comes great responsibility. As soon as you pick up a pen, or as soon as you start doing any visuals, you have a great responsibility not to mess it up. We see what we want to see. If you just figure out who you're doing the visual for, and you have an inkling of how they work in their heads. Take political parties, for instance. You have a pretty clear idea of what they're thinking of. It's so easy to shape your narrative that they're going to go, yep, yeah, makes sense, and they're not going to look twice at it. What's going to happen next? Well, their neighbors are going to come over and go, yeah, okay, oh, really? And their neighbors, and then the ball is rolling. That's how easy it is to appropriate to perpetuate an outright lie. I think increasing data literacy is key, absolute key. And I want you to go home and become more data literate. I want you to go home and help others become more data literate. I think this is one of the most critical skills in the world today. We're not doomed yet, not just yet. Be observant, be curious, and you may not get burned. My name is Alexander, and I thank you so much for your time.